Well, thanks everybody for those wonderful words of um, encouragement and, and awesome prayers. Um, we're, we're going through a little internet um, distress here tonight. So hopefully everything will be fine. I had to change laptops real quick, but I have on the other laptop maps that I wanted to share my screen that are kind of important to tonight. So hopefully it'll all iron out as, as we're going through this. I appreciate your, your prayers for my internet <laughs> um, and your patience. So the song, I, I saw a bunch of chats um, flying around. I, I love that person. It is one person. Um, and Eldridge is his last name. And if he's got a bunch of really wonderful music out on YouTube. Um, uh, under the name of Acapella Eldridge, <laughs> like Acapella Eldridge, but all kind of smashed together. Um, but I want to teach tonight on Paul's second itinerary. And I thought that song would be um, really appropriate for that, because if, if there was <laughs> one thing that um, the Apostle Paul was committed to, it was sending the light and bringing along with him wonderful prophets and teachers and pastors to do that with. So we're, we're going to look at, at some of that tonight. So I want to begin by recapping where we've been over the last couple of weeks. Um, John taught from Galatians, and then I taught from kind of weaving together Acts and Galatians, and last uh, Tuesday, taught about the Lord building his church, and we looked at Paul's first itinerary in some level of detail. So just to recap um, that, uh, you know, Paul's first itinerary was through the area of Galatia. It was 45 to 47 AD. It's covered in Acts 13, 2 through 14, 26. Um, and, you know, we talked about the specific problems that Paul was dealing with in Galatia, not only presenting Christ to Jews who weren't very happy about it, <laughs> also presenting Christ to Gentiles, and then dealing with born again Judaizing Christians who then didn't want those Gentiles to, to, to participate. And what a stir it caused in Jerusalem and all through the area that the Gentiles were actually getting born again. They were welcomed by Jesus, by God into the body of Christ. And it just caused an incredible stir. And um, when Paul returned from that itinerary, you know, he got the church together and report back to Antioch in Syria, which is north of, of Jerusalem by considerable distance. Um, he reported, um, as it's written, everything that God had done and that he had opened the door of faith for the Gentiles. And then we can pick this up. Um, well, in, in Acts 15, 1, in just a minute, um, at the close of Acts 14, it says that Paul spent no little time with the disciples when he returned from this itinerary and was in Antioch. And then what happened in 15, 1, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brothers saying, if you are not circumcised according to the law of Moses, the custom of Moses, you are not able to be saved. Now, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, the people appointed Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this question. And this in Acts 15, 1 and 2 would have been Paul's second trip to Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem Council occurs in 49 AD. But what we learned in previous weeks was that on Paul's first trip to Jerusalem, which was um, the famine relief trip, 
that Agabus had come up to Antioch or down to Antioch as it is in the scripture. And I'll explain a little more about that later. Um, that uh, Agabus came to Antioch and prophesied and, and brought forth words about this famine and they decided to send some relief and send it by the hands of Paul and Barnabas. That trip to Jerusalem resulted in a huge conflict and big stir about the Gentiles being born again. And that's the one that we read about in Galatians 2. Um, Acts 15, the rest of Acts 15 talks about what we call the Jerusalem Council, which was in 49 AD. And things with Paul completing that itinerary and then people coming from Judea to Antioch and saying, look, okay, so they're born again, but they have to be circumcised. I mean, this, this was a huge, huge conflict and had to be formally solved. And that is what occurred in Acts 15 with the, with the Jerusalem Council. And it was resolved with a letter, a decree, actually very formal and firm instruction to all of the believers that they had four conditions they had to fulfill as members in the body of Christ, as members in the churches, um, that the believers would abstain from food offered to idols, um, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Those were the four um, instructions, decrees that this letter contained. And then after that council, um, well, we can pick it up in Acts 15.30 down toward the end of this chapter, uh, when they concluded the council and wrote the letter, then they sent it off um, to Antioch um, with um, a group of people, uh, J Judas and Silas included, who were prophets in the area of Jerusalem, um, was with the party that went to Antioch. Of course, Paul and Barnabas went back to Antioch with them. Uh, to deliver to uh, the, the church there in Antioch that, that letter of those decrees. And in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming the good news of the word of the Lord with many others also. And there, there was great rejoicing over um, what this was to date, uh, a huge relief and resolution to this problem of may help helping the Jews and the Gentiles who were getting born again to actually get along. So in Acts 15 verse 36, um, after some days in Antioch, Paul and Barnab Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in every city in which we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas was intending to take John, who was also called Mark, with them also, but Paul was thinking it was not appropriate to take them with him, the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and did not go with them to the work. So Michelle, if you'll share the first itinerary. Okay. Let's see. All right. Awesome. Thank you. There you go. Okay. So we're looking at, this is the same map I showed you, I think it was last week. So they started from Antioch in Syria, and then they went to the island of Cyprus. And the they that I'm talking about is Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. And John Mark was with them all the way up to Perga. And then John Mark went home to Antioch. And Paul was upset about that. And so he says, I, well, I don't, you know, he didn't stick with us for the whole troop group 
trip, so I don't want him to come. And uh, there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark and with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Barnabas and John Mark were cousins and Barnabas was a native of Cyprus. So basically they went um, home, so to speak, to, to Cyprus and you know, as it turns out, we see from other areas in the scriptures that Paul was not the, the best judge of character in this situation. We see a little bit of Paul's hardheadedness. Um, and the reason we know that, and the reason we know also that Paul's and Barnabas's dissension um, didn't totally destroy their relationship. Because in 1 Corinthians 1.1, um, or in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions Barnabas, and um, John Mark is mentioned several different places. In Colossians, Paul refers to him as his helper. Um, in 2 Timothy, toward the end of Paul's life, Paul um, asked for John Mark to come to him. Um, and in 1 Peter, Peter refers to to John Mark as a son and makes it clear that he's with him in Babylon. So John Mark certainly didn't disappear. He, he didn't, you know, um, end his ministry in the body of Christ and neither, neither did Paul, I mean, by neither did Barnabas by any stretch. Uh, John Mark, mostly called Mark, is the one who wrote his gospel. Thanks, Michelle, the Gospel of Mark. So after that happened, then um, Paul chose Silas in Acts 15, 40, and departed being commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And now if you can display the second itinerary, there you go. So this is, this is the extent of Paul's second itinerary, and it was a long one, and it took place um, 50 to 53 AD. Um, it leaves from Antioch in Syria and goes back through the, some of the same churches where Paul had been on his first itinerary um, ministering. And then it goes up through Asia, the real focus of this itinerary is Greece, and we're going to go through this. And then the home trip was basically from Corinth to Ephesus, and then all the way back to Caesarea Maritima, down to J Jerusalem, and then back up to Antioch. So it was one big gigantic loop. So what happened on this itinerary? Well, he, he went to Derby and to Lystra, and a certain disciple was at Lystra named Timothy. And Michelle, you can stop sharing, but I will wanna go back to this if you can kind of leave it handy, thank you. Um, so he, he meets a disciple there named Timothy and Timothy had a Jewish mother who was a believer and a Gentile father. And he was well spoken of by the brothers who were at Lystra and Iconium. Now look at verse three. Paul wanted this man to go with him and he took and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And immediately this should raise your eyebrows. <laughs> After all of the confrontation that Paul had with the, the Jews over the grace of Jesus Christ, after two trips to Jerusalem with very pointed arguments about whether the circumcision was necessary or the law was still valid, here he takes Timothy and circumcises him. And, you know, we, although we don't know exactly why, he did this, um, what we can sort of surmise are a couple of things. And I did have um, 
a long conversation with, with my brother John about this, but um, one of the reasons may well have been for Timothy's protection. When you think about what, is, what Paul is anticipating um, in this itinerary is kind of the same stuff that he anticipated, that he experienced in the first itinerary. And remember, he was thrown out of cities. He was threatened to be stoned. He was actually stoned. There was tremendous vitriol and violence against Paul's message. And in anticipation of that, um, had all that stuff been happening again, Paul was thinking he could ameliorate that a bit by having Timothy circumcised. Another aspect might be Paul's perception of Timothy being better received and their evangelism being better received if the Jews, they were going to go into the synagogues and all of that stuff if the Jews knew that Timothy were circumcised. And again, we, we really can only surmise about that. Um, what Paul had anticipated doing this in this itinerary was going not only through Galatia, but through the cities of Asia. And when, not right now, but when we get the map up there again, I'll show you what, what I mean by that. Um, we know that he didn't do that because he was prevented by the Holy Spirit from, from doing that. But Asia was, those cities in Asia were heavily populated by Jews. And so Paul had really good reason to expect on this second itinerary, very much the same experiences that he had had on the first itinerary. So I think that, um, you know, T Timothy's protection and the power of their evangelism, Paul felt would be enhanced by this measure. It certainly wasn't out of fear. I mean, that, that is not in the record of Paul in the first itinerary in either trip to Jerusalem. I mean, he was perfectly willing and capable of arguing and defending and, and all of that um, with, without fear or hesitation. And the other thing I notice about this verse is Timothy's humility and trust <laughs> to go through that, that he really believed in Paul's reasoning and, and Paul's request to do that. And that, that says a whole lot for Timothy. And in verse four, while they were passing through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees they should keep. That's the ones that came out of the Jerusalem council and were um, codified in the letter, um, which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were at Jerusalem. And so the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. And I love that little summary verse um, because think about Paul's comfort as he went through these cities to realize, this, that, to realize that these churches were growing, that they had not fallen away, they had not been torn apart by the dissension between the born again pagans and the born again Jews. Remember that Paul wrote Galatians shortly after that first itinerary in 48 AD um, to, for the preservation of those young churches and how incredibly refreshing and comforting it must have been to Paul to go back through that area and find the churches prospering. So that's pretty cool. And then in verse six, so they went through Phygia and the region of Galatia having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in the province of Asia, and when they had come opposite Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not per permit them to go. And Michelle, if you wanna share that second itinerary map again. And now passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas. Thank you. So they picked up Timothy in Lystra, that's in the green area of Galatia, Right, and then they went along their way and notice how they skirted the northern perimeter of Asia. 
That's where Paul had wanted to go. All those cities that you see, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Smyrna, all of those, that's where Paul had anticipated he would go on this itinerary and the Holy Spirit said no. And then he thought, well, okay, I'll turn north into Bithynia and, and you know, minister and teach up there. And, and the spirit of the Lord Jesus said no. And so they went along on their way to the coastal city of Troas. And in verse 10, no, verse 9, a vision, you can leave the map up, Michelle. Um, a vision appeared to Paul during the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and entreating him and saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And if you see Macedonia is that orange area, right? This is part of Greece. And there's Neapolis and Philippi and some other cities that you'll recognize. Now, then verse 10, um, leave, still leave it up, Michelle. I'll, I'll let you know. When he saw the vision, immediately we sought to go over to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. And you can close the map just for now. So all this time, Acts has been written in third person. They did this. Paul did, you know, they went, they came, they, they, they. And now all of a sudden we have this, we. Why is that? Well, Luke authored Acts. The we sections in Acts indicate the portions of Paul's itineraries that Luke joined in. And there are three of them. And I, I want to just emphasize this because it absolutely gives us a window into who Luke is. So the first we section is this, Acts 16, 10 to 17 in Philippi. And it, it's the section of the itinerary sailing from Troas on the west, the west coast of Asia up into Philippi in Greece. The second we section is on Paul's third itinerary on the back end of it and goes from Philippi to Troas and then on to Jerusalem to the very end of that third itinerary. So that's a long period of time that Luke was traveling with Paul. So you could almost assume that Luke, between the first, third, second itinerary and third itinerary, that Luke stayed somewhere in the area of Philippi, because that's, you know, that's where he left Paul when Paul went on through Greece, and that's where he rejoined Paul on his, the backside of his third itinerary. The third we section in the book of Acts is Acts 27 and a portion of 28. And this is Paul's journey to Rome as a prisoner. And Luke was with Paul for that entire journey. And it's understood that Luke stayed with Paul rented a house in Rome and supported Paul and made sure that, that his needs were met during that whole time. So it, it really gives us a window into how incredibly loving and loyal Luke was to Paul. And that explains the three we sections in Acts and why the writing changes abruptly and then changes back abruptly at various points in the book of Acts. So they end up, um, you know, they went in verse 11, they set sail from Troas, ran a straight course to Samothrace, which was an island, then to Neapolis, a coastal city, and pay attention to verse 12. From there to Philippi, which is a leading city in that part of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in that city many days. Um, what is the significance of Philippi being called a Roman colony? Philippi was like, um, it was a city that was planted 
it was, it didn't like naturally evolve like so many cities do. It was, a, um, it was planted and it was populated primarily with Roman ex-soldiers. And we're going to see that there was no synagogue there, which is, is pretty interesting. So what happens is in verse 14, um, well, verse 13 and 14, um, Paul asked around the city and found a place where people gathered to pray by a, a river no synagogue, just people praying by a river. And he went there and spoke to the women who had come together. And that's where he witnessed to the woman named Lydia, who was a seller of purple cloth in verse 14, and one who was a worshiper of God. And Lydia was one of the God-fearing Greeks. And we, we've talked about that in past teachings that the God-fearers were, um, a, a well-defined group of Gentiles who had adopted the Jewish God as their own and worshiped that way, although they did not completely adopt the law, like the God-fearers were not circumcised people. Um, but Lydia was a God-fearer. Cornelius in Acts 10 was a God-fearer. Um, and she got baptized in verse 15 in her entire house. And, and then she constrained Paul and um, hit Silas and Timothy to stay with her, which is a very typical of Eastern hospitality. And then in verse 16, he's still in Philippi. They are still in Philippi. And it came to pass as we were going to the place of prayer, um, a certain slave girl who had a spirit of divination met us and was bringing her owners much profit by fortune telling. So this is a woman who had a demon that enabled her to tell the future and the spirit of div divination, read John's commentary as a wonderful uh, write up about this. It was the spirit of Python. It was the same demon essentially that made the Oracle of Delphi so effective. And she's following Paul and um, Luke and Timothy and Silas around and kept crying out saying, these men are servants of the most high who proclaim to you the way of salvation. What's the importance of that detail? Demons know who you are. <laughs> And they will speak the truth. This was a very true statement. But, you know, she did this for many days. And Paul was greatly disturbed and turned to the spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out. And it came out that very hour. And why was Paul so disturbed as she was saying something that was very true? Well, it was the source. She was a demonized woman. She was used for fortune telling, for uh, financial gain, for her, her owners. So, you know, this whole demonic situation, Paul didn't want any part of it and cast the spirit out. And I, I'm going to just kind of narrate some of this stuff because I can see that we're, you know, it's getting kind of late with the delays we've had over the visuals. But, um, so, we, you know, when her owners saw that she could no longer tell the future, they were angry, you know, their income had just disappeared. They were, they were furious and um, brought Paul and the group to the magistrates and said, I mean, verse 20, these men being Jews are seriously disturbing our city. Well, you know, I don't know about seriously disturbing the whole city, but they were certainly disturbing those men's livelihood. Um, and then in, in verse 21, and are promoting customs that are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or to observe, and that was an outright lie. At this time in the Roman Empire, Christianity was still legal. It was frowned upon, but it, it was not unlawful. And, um, oh, I wanted to mention the marketplace in verse 19. So where, where did this happen? Um, what is the marketplace and what's the significance of it? 
the marketplace, the, the Greek word um, is agora, and it's at like a town center. It's not only a place of commerce, but there was a judgment seat there. And, and anyway, a lot of important things would happen in this, in this marketplace. And so that's what the rulers that Paul and Silas got dragged um, to was, uh, that's why they were there in the marketplace because that's where they worked. There was a judgment seat there in the Agora. And so they, they beat Paul and Silas with rods and threw him into prison and um, charged the jailer to keep them safely. And then we know what follows here is that the Philippian jailer, there's a, you know, Paul and Silas are in there singing and praying and there's the miracle of an earthquake and their chains are loosed and the jailer comes in and, and of course he, he gets saved. Um, but we'll pick it up in, in verse 34, 5, because I love what Paul, um, you know, the next day, I love Paul's response when the magistrates sent po their policemen and said, please just, you know, release the men and let them go quietly. And <laughs> Paul's reaction to that is, I don't think so. Heck no, we're not going quietly. We have been beaten publicly uncondemned we are romans and they've thrown us into prison and now do they throw us out secretly no indeed i'm in verse 37 but let them come themselves and bring us out and you know when the, the police reported these words back to the magistrates and um they then they came personally the magistrates and um asked the party to leave the city and so paul went back uh, you know said his goodbyes to lydia and other believers and moved on but i love the um the boldness and the fearlessness of paul and his refusal to slink out of the city even though you know i mean he'd just been beaten by these um, you know, the policemen and the magistrates, uh, but to, to boldly turn right back around and, and confront that um, is really quite remarkable. And we, we heard that in Cindy's prophecy today about our boldness, our God calling us out to be bold and empowering us to be bold. And this is the kind of boldness that we can have as well. So, um, where where did uh, Paul go from here again? Acts 17. So they move on to Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, there, there was a synagogue there and for a while had great success and were getting people saved and a wonderful response until verse five. But the Jews, <laughs> here we go again, right? becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from among them who loitered at the marketplace, again, town center, formed a mob and were setting the city in an uproar and assaulting the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. Jason evidently was housing Paul and the people he were traveling with. And um, you know, Paul, again, getting confused of turning the world upside down and, 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 and so forth. And, you know, it's all exaggeration. And anyway, um, this wonderful believer, Jason, ended up paying a security, which would be something kind of like a bail or bond um, in order to um, well, one, it was a security that Paul would stop or that he would leave town. And it really did put Paul in a bind. He had to comply with that or Jason would have been out all, all of that money. But as it was, since Paul left, the implication is that, is that Jason would have um, gotten that money back when Paul left. And they did leave by night and went to Berea in, in Acts 18. Um, 10. I'm sorry, 1710. So, and then they, they spent some time in, in um, 
Berea and let me just catch my place again. Okay, right. And then so, you know, and they they had a better reception in Berea than they had had in Thessalonica until in verse 13, the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, and they came there also stirring up and troubling the multitudes. Um, and then immediately the brothers and sisters sent Paul away to go as far as to the sea, but Silas and Timothy stayed in, in Berea. And notice we've gone back now to the third person. So we, we finished, Luke is no longer there. Luke stayed in Philippi or somewhere near that area of Philippi. And so Paul went on down further into, into Greece and went down to Athens. Pa Timothy and Silas stayed in Berea for a while until Paul sent for them. And the, the record in Athens in, um, in Acts 17 is just a, a beautiful illustration of how Paul witnessed. And um, Athens was a city that was replete with idols. It was very religious. It was also a philosophical center. And at, at, um, at Athens, Paul was brought before the Areopagus. And the Areopagus, and that's in verse 19, the Areopagus was both a place and a court. So it had a very interesting role in the culture of Athens. And what's unclear about what happens here is whether or not Paul was like hauled before the Areopagus to defend in a formal sense, like a trial or um, a judicial investigation, or if it was just happened to be the place where he landed um, in Athens to give kind of an informal speech. But, the, and that's where this beautiful message occurred, the, the end result of which one of the Areopagites believed and, and a bunch of other um, important people of Athens. And then Paul went down to Corinth and Acts 18. Um, after the, in 18.1, after these things, he departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila. Um, another you know, pillar of the church, um, Aquila and his wife Priscilla, um, who had recently come from Italy. They were Jews. They left Italy because the emperor Claudius threw out all the Jews. Um, and then Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, and um, Paul ends up staying in Corinth for um, between a year and six months and two years. It, it really depends. And it was from Corinth that Paul wrote First and Second Thessalonians. And um, interesting things that happened in Corinth. He was again hauled before the magistrates. Um, the, the leader of the synagogue, Crispus, was born again. Then um, Crispus apparently either resigned or was forced out of the synagogue because of his devotion to Christ. And a guy named Sosthenes took his place who um, was beaten <laughs> by the Jews on Paul's behalf um, and later became a very faithful follower of Paul. And we know this because he was um, in Ephesus with Paul when Paul wrote First Corinthians. And then basically, um, you know, Paul, after that, it, down in verse 18, um, starts to talk about his, his return trip all the way back, um, stopping at Ephesus, all the way back to Caesarea Maritima, and then Jerusalem, and then back up to Antioch. I mean, it, it's a, it's full. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry for the rush to get through it, but um, it's well worth going through it again. So what are the key points? 
um, to what stood out to me about this whole itinerary um, is the new pillars of the church that we meet and some of the ones who had been pillars, um, Barnabas, John Mark, um, Silas, we meet Silas in this itinerary, Timothy, Luke, Aquila, and Priscilla. And, you know, from reading the book of Acts and the epistles, um, you know, those, those are people who really stand out in our minds as incredible faithful believers. Um, the cities that Paul went to on this itinerary, and I had said before that Greece was kind of really the focus. That's where most of the press in the verses of Acts that um, encompass this itinerary are. Um, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth. And so we have later epistle to the Philippians, two epistles to the Corinthians that were written from Ephesus, and two epistles to the Thessalonian believers. And those epistles were actually written while Paul was in Corinth during that year and a half that he was there. And how rich our lives are because of those epistles that were written and how much truth do we know um, because of those epistles. And it's in reading those epistles and fitting them together with the book of Acts that we understand so much more about the struggles that the believers had and how Paul ministered directly to the believers. What we see from Acts is a narrative of the events, but what we see from the epistles is the real richness of their lives and how they either got along or didn't get along and what they were good at and what they weren't good at and what they needed to correct and how they needed to grow and what new revelation did they need to hear in those epistles. Um, there's also kind of a change of flavor, although the Jews did cause a lot of trouble in Thessalonica um, and, and then in Berea. In Corinth, they weren't successful. It fell completely flat. Gallio, the, the, the um, proconsul appointed by the Romans, um, could have cared less that, that Paul and his group were dragged before them. He just dismissed the whole thing. So it's hard to see a real change of flavor. There, there's eventually more, way more acceptance of Jews in the church and pagans in the church. And the problems become very different problems. And those are addressed in those epistles that I just mentioned. 